right. I'll make you pancakes on Monday of finals week, the Christmas cafe. We're talking about developmental biology today, which I love to talk about. And I, amazingly, there's a whole entire class dedicated to this next semester. So if you're looking for an upper division elective, four units. Um, so in developmental biology, um, development is like a, a, a hybrid or a conglomeration of a bunch of different disciplines. Um, it's what was traditionally embryology, just studying embryos. Um, historically, studying embryos was just looking at you know, embryos of animals or looking at spontaneously aborted fetuses of humans, uh, just like categorizing physiologically, morphologically, what do they look like, um, you know, what was happening at each stage. Developmental biology became a discipline when we started being able to apply genetics and cell biology to embryos and made it an experimental science. So embryology was just kind of descriptive. You just looked at organisms, drew them, described them. Uh, developmental biology is experimental, though. Like, what are the genes getting turned on? We can actually ask questions, do experiments uh, to see how, uh, how organisms develop. And the, the big question in developmental biology is how does a single fertilized egg, and here's a single fertilized human egg under scanning electron microscopy. Now, it's artificially colored, uh, but this is, a, this is a human egg. These are little uh, cells that came from uh, the ovary, the little um, follicle cells on it. Um, that single egg is going to differentiate, like it's going to divide, and at some point, cells start deciding what kind of tissue to become. We call that differentiation. Right? A neuron becomes different from a skin cell at an early stage in development. And eventually, you make up all the different types of tissues in the body. So this is one of the main questions of developmental biology. What is it that's actually happening in those cells at the genetic level, at the cell level, that actually makes those two cell types different from each other? So we call that differentiation. Uh, one of the other issues is morphogenesis. So not only do the cells become different in terms of like the genes they're expressing and what the cell's function is, but also they form different shapes together, right? Um, you have uh, morphology is the study of form. So how does the nose actually form in the shape that it forms it? How do cells organize them in, uh, in three dimensions, right? So the, the issue of morphogenesis, also the issue of growth and proportion is a really interesting question in development. If you think about your limbs, so here, here's an experiment. Take your arms, put them out. They match up, mirror image to each other, right? Your arms are the same length, pretty much, right? Within a centimeter. Your hands, you know, your middle finger on each of your hands is the same length, same proportion, probably really close to the same width, right? Your ring size on one hand is pretty close to the ring size on your other hand. But those two tissues developed on entirely different sides of your body, right? Right? There was no one arm and then it like, you know, split into two and we symmetrically could copy it, right? They grew on different sides of your body. How does your body know to make your arms the same length and make your hands proportionally the same size, right? Um, that's a fundamental issue in developmental biology, right? How does the tissue know to do that? Um, so, um, you grow proportionally as well. Um, I should get a picture of this, but uh, if you take little Karis, my daughter Karis is a year and a half, and if you take her arms and try and put them over her head, she can like barely get her hands to touch over the top of her head because her head is so huge and her arms are so <laughs> short. She is way differently proportioned than I as an adult who can you know, put my hands way above my head and there's all this space, right? So heads grow slower and not as much as arms do in the course of growth. So uh, developmental biology is more than just embryology, right? Be yeah, Karis is born, she's you know, self-sustaining, right? But she's continuing to grow and develop and change proportion. So we're, developmental biology is, is more than just embryology. It is embryology plus growth and development and maturity, um, you know, undergoing uh, sexual maturation or if you have a larval stage, you go from a larval stage and you pupate and metamorphose and turn into a completely different adult. Um, even aging, reproduction, all of this life cycle stuff is incorporated into developmental biology too. Um, 
the idea of how organisms differ from each other and how they have changed over time is a part of developmental biology. So there's a whole discipline of evolutionary biology. You know, what did, uh, if two organisms share a common ancestor, uh, what happened in the differentiation between them? How have they changed in terms of their embryology? And then also, um, oh, where was I going with that? Uh, oh, eco-devo. Uh, how, the, uh, how the environment actually impacts how organisms develop. So certain organisms will develop in different ways depending on the environment they're in. Um, you know, certain insects will change coloration based on the food source or the environment that they're around. Um, sometimes insects, what the mother is eating at the time of making her eggs will determine how the eggs and the, and the second generation look and form. So she'll actually be putting like information about what the foliage is and the food source is, and she actually like deposits information in a way into her egg so that her offspring, when they hatch out, are suited to the environment that they're going to hatch out in. And if she was feeding on a different source, her offspring would look different. Um, so there's lots of interesting ecology and evolution and organismal life cycle uh, that goes into developmental biology. Will, did you have a question? It's kind of off, not off topic at all, but. I mean, well, then talking, ask it if it's on topic. Well, I, I feel like you <laughs> might talk about it, so I didn't want to jump ahead of you. But when you oh, think growth okay. in proportion, are you talking about how our cells know? It's, it's probably not fair to say our cells know as much as, they, as, much as it is yeah. that they just okay. are programmed the same. Yeah, yeah. So when I'm, I'm definitely anthropomorphizing here, right? The, I just didn't know. If there's I no know. consciousness going on. But, but somehow there's some pattern, there's some program that tells one side of the body to be proportional to the other side of the body. Yeah. I mean, same with kidneys, and we're pretty, pretty symmetrical down the midline, yeah, yeah. There's some weird asymmetries, too, you know, like your liver is off of the one, and your, your gut loops to one direction, and those are interesting questions, too. All right, so I'm going to walk through, just real quickly, a couple of these, and kind of the questions we ask, and kind of the experiments we do. So differentiation is this idea of at what point in the embryo do cells decide to become a certain fate, right? So early on, you've got a fertilized egg, a zygote. It has, you know, it's a fertilized egg is the mother of all stem cells, right? Um, because it's going to become every single tissue type in the body, right? So in a sense, developmental biology and differentiation is the study of stem cells, right? How cells become different, how they're, uh, generic to begin with and how they take on their specific fates later. So embryos, almost all embryos uh, have a fertilized egg. They go through some rapid cell division and they become a blastula embryo. So it's a lot of cells. There's usually a cavity, empty space in the inside of the embryo. And there's a really fundamental process where certain cells from the outside move inside into this, uh, into this cavity. Uh, that process is called gastrulation. So in this embryo, all of these uh, cells that were colored yellow, they have moved to the inside, and the blue cells have spread out and have gone around the outside. So the, bl the blue on the top has stretched out around, and the yellow in has gone into the middle. And there's a third layer that's squeezed in between them as well. This is the first major um, differentiation point. Right, cells that are now on the outside of the embryo have been fated to do outside kind of things. These red ones that are squished in the middle are going to do middle kind of things, like make your muscle and make internal organs. And the, one, the yellow ones that are on the very inside are going to become the most visceral organs, like the lungs and the gut. So you've already got uh, three major distinctions between here. We call these the ectoderm, the outside, the mesoderm is the middle, and the endoderm is the gut. So we start talking about how do each of these germ layers, we call these the three main germ layers, because they're the, like, the original three, and they subsequently differentiate, right? So the cells on the outside of this embryo become skin, epidermis, they become neurons, and they become this really interesting class of cells called the neural crest. These are like early neurons, and they break off, and they go spread out all over the all over the embryo. Um, the pigment cells in your skin are neural crest. Um, a lot of your sensory receptors in your skin are neural crest. Um, bones in the face that actually give your face shape and cartilage are all from the neural crest. Um, if a bird has a beak or a bill, it was determined by what the neural crest cells did when they came into the face. So 
Um, and we could talk about all these different cell types, but basically development is asking, what are the genes that are necessary to get these cell types turned on? How do you specify them? And how they become independent from each other? So the endoderm, outside, or ectoderm, outside stuff. Mesoderm, this is bones and muscles and red blood cells. And the endoderm, the really inside, is digestive, lungs, thyroid. And then there's also your germ cells, too. Early in development, you set aside cells that are going to become eggs or sperm. And you hold on to them. When you actually make the gonads, then you bring those two together. So, so this is the idea of cellular differentiation. The other question was morphogenesis. If you think about your hand, you've got a lot of different skin type or a lot of different cell types in your hand, right? You've got skin cells, you've got muscle, you've got neurons, you've got blood vessels, you've got cartilage, hair, all kinds of different cell types that are in your hand. And if you took all those cell types out, you could actually grow all those cell types in culture, right? I could take some skin cells and grow them. I could take some bone cells and grow them. And I could have like these different petri dishes all growing these different cell types, right? So you could kind of like you know, take cultures or take little uh, biopsies of all those different types of cells. Now, if you had them all growing in tissue culture and you brought them back together in a big petri dish, you're not going to get a hand, right? <laughs> you're just going to get a bunch of differentiated cells, right? So the question in development is, what's the difference between the two, right? Why do they take on a, a form, a three-dimensional functional form, and not just be a bag of differentiated cells, right? So cell differentiation tells you why these cells are different from each other. And I've just artificially colored them to illustrate it. But just sticking a bunch of differentiated cells together does not give you a hand, right? So what is the additional information, the different pattern that actually gives you that three-dimensional form and structure? So. Excellent yeah. question. Sure <laughs> right. So the kind of things we ask are like, how do cells orient themselves in a field? Like how do they separate themselves into the actual structures and, and know their relationships with each other? What cells should be on my right? What should be on my left? How big should we get? How many times should we divide? How do they communicate with each other to make sure that proportion remains the same? And there's a lot of cell movement as well. And how do they move around each other and know where to go? These neural crest cells are really the, uh, the fascinating uh, migratory cells in your body. They start off on the, on the back side of the spinal cord. So in the early embryo, you've got a spinal cord forming. So this tissue wraps up into a tube. And then these neural crest cells like just pop off the top of that tube, and they go migrating all over the rest of the embryo. And then they make all these diverse structures based on that. Like how do the cells know where to go, when to stop, when to stop migrating, which pathway to take? Um, this is all under morphogenesis. Um, Genetically, there's kind of two main dividing points, I guess, when cells are deciding what to become. There's an issue of cell specification. A cell is specified when it's been set on a pathway to become a certain cell type, but is not irreversible at that point. So in the ectoderm, the cells that are on the outside of the embryo, they have been specified to become ectoderm but you can often, in certain embryos, take ectodermal cells, stick them in the endoderm, and they will recognize, oh, I'm not surrounded by ectoderm. I'm not on the outside of the embryo anymore. I'm on the inside. And they will then change their specification, and they'll say, oh, I, I guess I'm in the context of a place where I should become guts and not skin. Right? So that would be a cell that is specified. It's directed towards a cell type, and if you let the embryo go, it's going to become skin. But if you move it to a different location, it's not, you know, it hasn't quite made up its mind, right? You can reverse its specification and put it in the context of a gut, and it'll adopt, you know, do things in your, in your digestive system. Cell differentiation is where you've been directed towards a cell type, 
And no matter what you do, at least in terms of like putting it in a different context, it's going to keep staying on that pathway. So this would happen later, typically later in development, where you actually take a skin cell. If you take, a skin, if you take one of your skin cells and put it in your gut, it's not going to just like incorporate into your gut tissue and become a functional uh, you know, intestinal cell. Right? It's already, we say it's already committed or it's already differentiated, permanently differentiated. And so it's either going to die or not play the proper function if you've transplanted it someplace else. So in developmental biology, we think about like, what are the actual cell signals? What are the genes that are expressed? What is the actual mechanism to specify a cell and then to also you know, determine a cell and basically limit its options so that it can't become anything else? And then also, because developmental biology is, is stem cells are in a sense developmental biology, right? They, a cell develops toward a certain type and it's either paused and be, is a stem cell, so it can still become a multiple types. Or if we're interested in actually getting you know, bone marrow cells to become neurons, we basically have to back them up in developmental time, right? Decide what were those commitment steps that made it differentiated into a bone marrow cell? And what were the specification steps that told it to, to be in that area to begin with? Genetically, do we know what those were? And can we reverse those so that we can turn a bone marrow cell into a neuron? Right? So we ha may have to like, you know, give it certain communication, uh, certain signals, right? If uh, being in the context of other bone cells was important, well then we might have to give it, you know, signals that were in the context of being a neuron. So we might have to give it secreted factors, uh, cell signals, cell cell, you know, mimic cell cell interactions that neurons were having to try and get that bone marrow cell to forget it's a bone marrow cell and think it's a, a, a neuron or we might have to change gene expression. We might have to actually stop, uh, actually force the cell to stop making bone marrow type cell uh, genes and start forcing it to make neural type genes and try and influence it to, t to change its commitment level. So in a sense, uh, stem cell work is developmental work, right? We learn about what those pathways were in development and then if you want to manipulate them, you can do that in st stem cell biology, right? Yeah? What makes them um Non-reversible. Um, well, it, it's it's complicated. Um, it, it's often the chromosomal state, right? If you've if you've condensed all the chromosomes that are necessary for turning uh, neural genes on, you basically limited your fate to become something other than neural, right? If you just every cell's got the same genome, but if you've condensed it and and put it in its condensed off form, then the cell has no access to that anymore. So that's why you may have to go in and force the cell to remodel its chromosomes to make those cells to become a neuron available to it anymore. And then you might actually have to give it signals to tell it to turn those genes on. So, but it, it's different in every cell type and we're still figuring it out. So, yeah. Does this have application to like mutations in certain cells? Because if you pause the cell before it differentiates, then it won't need to, right? So like- If you so say that again, if you do what to a cell? Like before? if, for instance, if you pause a cell in a certain phase yeah. um, prior to mutation, then wouldn't that have applications in treating diseases? Uh, yeah, I mean, for diseases that happen because of a cell mutating, yeah, so like cancer, yeah, yeah if, if we can understand at what point, you know, what is the cell fate of that cell that's been mutated, then we can specifically treat the type or, or try and get it to send signals for that cell type to shut off and not divide, yeah. yeah. So in a sense, cancer could be, you know, cancer is uncontrolled cell growth cells are growing in a very controlled manner in development. So in a sense, in a very broad sense, you could think of cancer as a developmental biology question. But, but there's no like, real research done in that area? Yeah, no, there is. Yeah, yeah. All right. One of the ways we study this is through microarrays and gene expression analysis. We've talked about several types of gene expression analysis, like taking two cell types and just looking at what are the different RNAs that are actually being expressed in those cells. So we talked about doing this by northern blot, right? You could just take a, a bunch of cells from one cell type, isolate all the mRNA, run it out on a gel, and probe for certain genes, are they present? And then take RNA from a different cell type, run those out on a gel, probe, and see are the cells uh, expressing that same gene. Um, we talked about uh, microarrays as well, looking at many, many different mRNAs at the same time. So taking a bunch of 
sample from one cell type and the other cell type, putting them on the microarray and seeing what are the levels, you know. So every single one of these dots on the microarray is a little probe for an mRNA. And so, you know, this one in red says one cell type is expressing this in really high levels. Um, a yellow type would be, well, they're expressing that gene in equal levels. And a green one, it's kind of hard to see the contrast, but something like this, a green, green guy. That would be the other cell type is expressing this gene in higher levels than, than it. So we're often doing comparative studies, right? At like this embryo, we take an embryo at stage one and we take its tissue and look at what are the genes expressed at that time. Then at stage two, take the mRNA there, look and see what are the genes expressed at that time. Um, basically what you get then is a list of genes that are turned on in the cell, right? So if I'm looking to see what is the difference between a neuron and a glial cell, now you take neurons and you look, well, gene A, B, C seem to be turned on in neurons, glial cells, genes D, E, F. Um, it's interesting stuff because you're like, you know, what are the genes expressed? You basically just get big long lists of genes though, um, which isn't, isn't quite as sexy as looking at embryos, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you look at embryos? Um, this is a technique called in situ hybridization. Uh, what in situ hybridization is, is basically it's like, it's like doing a northern blot, but doing a northern blot on an intact entire embryo. So rather than taking cells and killing all the cells and extracting out all the mRNA and running it out on a gel and then probing the gel, what we're doing is we're probing the entire embryo. So in situ means Roughly in Latin, it means in its proper place or in its location. So we're trying to say, what are the cells in the embryo that express this certain gene that I'm interested in? Okay. This is called gene expression analysis in the embryo itself. Um, so what you do is you, you would clone a piece of DNA that correlates to the gene that you're interested in looking at. Okay. We have cloned the senseless gene from Drosophila, right? We actually have it in a plasmid vector. It's growing in bacteria. Right? Um, we could trick those bacteria into making an mRNA of whatever we've stuck in that little plasmid. If we trick the bacteria and say, this little piece of the senseless gene that's in this plasmid, make an anti-sense copy of the mRNA. We could force the bacteria to basically make us probe for it. Right, make us an anti-sense copy of the senseless gene. If we used that, if we labeled that, that little anti-sense probe and soaked it with an embryo, that anti-sense probe should stick to the mRNA in that embryo, wherever, in whatever cells it's expressing it in. And if it's got some color to it, we can then see in the embryo where that senseless gene is expressed. And we could take a, you know, an unfertilized egg and probe it with senseless and see is senseless turned on in the egg. We could take an early stage embryo, see is senseless turned on here, take a later stage embryo. So you can get a whole array, basically a time lapse photography of embryos and say exactly when and where, at what time and in what cells does the senseless gene get turned on. Um, here is a, a Drosophila embryo. I forget what even, what gene this was, but this is a, an early stage embryo, and the mRNA for this guy is expressed in one side of the egg, not in the middle, and at the other side. At a later stage, this is stage five. Uh, don't worry about what the actual stages are, but this is later in development. It's stage six. That mRNA gets restricted now. So instead of being all over in all these cells, it's now just in these cells, in stripes of those cells. And at a later stage, you can actually see it's in the nucleus of these cells. And you can just then trace which cells at what time in development are expressing this certain gene that you're interested in. And you can do this over and over and over for all the genes that you're, you get, you know, just vast amounts of data of when and where those cells, uh, cells express your gene. Yeah? For the labeling, are there, um, so it can be like radioactive fluorescent, are there any types of labeling that it cannot, that you can't label your probe with? Um, or just whatever? Well, usually you label your probe in two ways. This way, the probe is labeled with a little um, molecule that, um, 
that creates an immune response. So it's an antisense piece of DNA. It sticks to the mRNA. And you have to have a dead, dead embryo to do this. You have to take the embryo. You have to kill the embryo. You have to fix the tissue so that you make all these holes in the cell membrane so that your probe gets access. And then this little guy creates a color change. So everywhere, this is a dead embryo. All of my probe has stuck to the mRNA in these cells. And then I, I put an additional chemical in it, and it turned those cells blue. Right? So, so you have to stage them. right? I have to collect embryos, kill them all at this stage, collect more embryos, kill them at the next stage, and fix the tissue. So is there like an antigen leaving that creates an immune response? It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when I, when I say soak it and, and it changes color, um, you soak it in an antibody, and that antibody recognizes the little label that's on the mRNA, and then attached to that antibody is an enzyme that turns the substrate blue. So it's, it's a fairly complicated thing. I just want you to know the reason this is blue is because the antisense, M uh, antisense probe is hybridizing to the mRNA. And then we do just you know, some chemistry and get it to, to change color. But I don't care that you know the chemistry. You can, and you get beautiful pictures like this. <laughs> this is fluorescent labeling. Now, um, you can do fluorescent in C2 labeling. Uh, this, this is actually, um, well, some of this is artificially colored, but you could also make this um, by a reporter gene. We talked about reporters before. Um, you could hook up the promoter site of your gene and hook it up to green fluorescent protein and inject it into the one cell, the fertilized egg. Right? So in the fertilized egg cytoplasm is the little piece of DNA with the promoter region for your gene hooked up to green fluorescent protein. So, whenever, so every cell then, as it divides, inherits the cytoplasm from that egg. And so every, every cell in this C squirt embryo has got the promoter region of your gene hooked up with GFP in the cytoplasm. And what can happen is that can get turned on. Whenever your gene gets turned on, the transcription factors sit down on your little transgenic piece, sit down on the promoter there. So whenever your gene gets turned on, it also turns on the green fluorescent protein that you've stuck in there. And so I can do this now in a live embryo. Right? I injected this into a live cell, and I can just watch this embryo develop under the microscope. And whenever my gene gets turned on, cells in that embryo will start glowing. And I can watch a single embryo in real time develop and see when the gene expression is going on, which is really amazing, right? Because now you don't have to fix all these embryos and kill them at all these different stages. You can just actually take time lapse photography and take a picture of the exact same embryo. So here. Uh, this is green fluorescent protein being expressed in the cells of the notochord of the, uh, of the C squirt. And then uh, this was actually done with, uh, by a colleague in, in my lab, or in the lab I was in in grad school. And then he's artificially colored the other um, cell types. But this is neural tissue in yellow. And this is muscle here in red. And this is gut here in blue. And then this is purple ectoderm on the outside of it. What this also allows you to do is trace the fates of cells. Because you can add, like, uh, you could put green fluorescent protein into a cell type that you know gets turned on in that cell type. And then you can watch early in development. Right? So early in this embryo, uh, this is uh, at the, actually at the eight cell stage of a C squared embryo. So this is a little cartoon I made of an eight cell stage embryo. Uh, there's another identical uh, four cells on the other side of this. So we're looking at one side of the embryo. The other side would be a mirror image of it. But at this stage, all of the notochord cells actually come from this single cell in the eight cell. So half of them come from that one, half of them come from the other. Uh, if this is the right-hand side, then the other left-hand side. Those two cells give rise to all the notochord. And all the brain tissue comes from the two cells up here. And all of the gut tissue comes from that cell. And all of the ectoderm comes from that cell. So this is a fate map. Right? I'm actually figuring out at the cellular level what is the ancestor of all the notochord cells. Right? So notochord cells come from 
those two cells in the early embryo. So in regards to bioethics, this, like, um, we would say this is more ethical, and then why did so well, not, ma use not many people are concerned yeah. about yeah. C-squirt rights, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this isn't done on, like, um... This is not done in humans. Okay. Yeah. But would it be in the future, potentially? Oh. Like, I don't know. Like stem cells or I mean, it could be done. Like, we have the technology to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, and people have, have watched embryos develop, right? Um, so we have really good staging maps of human development and where the cells go. Um, no one's done transgenics like this, you know, gotten cells to fluoresce and then looked at human embryos develop. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's illegal, but no one's, as far as I know, no one's done that. Yeah. So. That was kind of my question. Yeah. How do you even trace human development if you can't use these kinds of mm -hmm. methods? It's hard. Um, C squirts are easy. <laughs> um, the simpler the organism, obviously, the easier it is to follow. So. Uh, in every single C-squirt embryo that you look at, that, those two cells go on to become the notochord. Right? So really early in development, those have been faded. They've been specified to become notochord, and if you don't do anything to them, they will differentiate into notochord, and they'll do it the same every time. A human embryo, even a frog embryo, a mouse embryo, you can't get this precision. Right? There's not two cells at the four cell stage or the eight cell stage that always become a certain tissue. Cells move around and they die and they different coordinate. And so if you look at any two mouse embryos, you, you can't get cell level precision because there's just, it doesn't exist at that point. So it's, it's harder, right? So you have to kind of make generalized maps and you say like, well, generally the brain comes from generally this region of the embryo. Whereas in the C squared, I can say, the brain comes from there and the other cell behind it. <laughs> um, so. But can't you fix the cell at different phases so that it doesn't migrate, but, but then that would require the killing of the embryo? Yeah, you would have killed the embryo at that time. But in so, that case, it would Yeah, and, and you could, like in mouse and in zebrafish and all these other organisms, you can do fate maps, but in one embryo, you know, cell number one goes on and becomes notochord. In embryo number two, cell number one doesn't become notochord, it becomes brain tissue, right? So there's these fuzzy edges where sometimes cells become one type, but in another embryo. So you have to look at you know, hundreds of embryos and then do like statistics and say, you know, like 75% of the time, this cell at this stage becomes this tissue type, and the other 25% it becomes this tissue type, right? So, you know, they're, they're more flexible. They're kind of plastic in their early levels. Um, uh, this is part of the reason, I mean, C-squirts develop really, really quickly, so they just make these decisions really early and just like, I got to get to be in a tadpole. Whereas <laughs> you're a human, it's, you know, you've got nine months of gestation, right? You can kind of take your time about specifying cells. It so. could be like the Human Genome Project on cells. But on, well, yeah, well, people are doing that, They're like taking individual cells and seeing okay. what, what the genome looks like and what cells are, you know, what genes are expressed, so, That's yeah. Cool. Um, Will, and then. Um, I wanted to know, I know that certain experiments are done where they take, um, I think it's actually probably done with genes, but maybe it's cells where they take a cell uh, or a trait like a firefly and they'll take the fluorescence of yeah. the firefly. Is mm -hmm. that a gene or a cell? And, and then my that's, question? Yeah, that's a gene. It's a luminescent oh. gene, right? Oh, it is. Yeah, okay. it just it, it glows rather than fluoresces, but yeah. Okay, I was just wondering if it was a cell, if they, if they put that in during development because it's easier for it to become a part of the... Uh, that well, sounds like it's a different question. Then. Yeah, it's a different question. Um, okay. I mean, it's just the difference between why do a fluorescent molecule versus a luminescent molecule? Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, I was just wondering if, yeah, if like, if, because it's, such, it's still in its differentiation stage, if you wanted to add a trait that wasn't normally part. Oh, I see. Like, like yeah. luminescent, that's what, that was my question. I see, I see. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to like make an organism luminescent that wasn't previously luminescent, okay. you can do that, and people have done that. I mean, they have, you know, they have uh, zebrafish that glow <laughs> in the dark because they have gotten the firefly luciferase gene and made an expression construct that took the promoter from a skin cell gene and hooked it up to the firefly luciferase gene and injected that into the zebrafish and it got incorporated, it recombined and, and incorporated into the genome. And so now every offspring from that original um, fish has got glowing skin cells. <laughs> Because the cell thinks, oh, that's a promoter region for a gene that I should express because I'm a skin cell. 
but we have tricked it and put the luciferase gene there. So every time it turns on that gene, it also turns on luciferase and the organism glows. So they've done that with fluorescent molecules and luminescent molecules, and there's lots of interesting transgenic lines. So we have a transgenic line of sea squirts that glows, all of its neurons glow green because we've got a stable integration of green fluorescent protein under the direction of a neuron promoter gene. And so this whole line of sea squirts, if you take one of those sea squirts, look at underneath the fluorescent scope and shine wavelength of light at it, every neuron starts glowing green at you. Yeah, we have that in lots of organisms. I mean, zebrafish and fruit flies and nematode worms, and we have all these transgenic lines where you've got cell types and gene lines marked by these fluorescent proteins, so, yeah. And you can just go order them, too. Just like, really? call up the sea squirt facility in Santa Barbara and you say, I'm really interested in that, you know, green fluorescent uh, ETR line you've got, and they'll send it to you, and if you can culture them, you could do experiments on them as well, so, yeah. All right, what else do I want to say? Um, oh, here's an interesting thing. This is like way off topic, but we've got four minutes left, so I'll just tell you about PAX6. Um, PAX6 is a gene that's expressed during um, the development of mul many different organisms. And in fact, most multicellular organisms have PAX6. Um, it's involved in a couple of different things. It's involved in um, the differentiation of the eye. It's also involved in, I think it's involved in the pancreas, making the pancreas. Um, but it's in, it triggers the development of eye. It turns on genes that are specific to the eye. So if you, if you mutate the PAX6 gene in flies, they don't make eyes. It's the same gene, PAX6, that turns on eye development in this organism, which is an octopus eye. So the same gene that, that triggers the pathway to make eyes in fruit flies and in octopus and in mammals, here's some, some cat, uh, same gene turns it on. And in fact, the gene is so similar that if you have a fly who has a mutation in PAX6 and isn't making eyes, you can take like the mouse pack six, and if you get the mouse pack six expressed in the fly, the fly will make its eyes again. So the two genes, and these are drastically different eyes, right? I mean, a compound eye in a fly and a mammal eye in a mouse, very different eyes, but the same gene is patterning both of them. Um, evolutionarily speaking, the common ancestor that would have existed between a fly and a mouse doesn't have eyes, right? <laughs> um, so the eyes have, have, have evolved separately, right? There wasn't a precursor eye, and they're both descendant from this individual that had a precursor. Like eyes, evolutionarily speaking, eyes must have been a novel invention in, in insects, but they used PAX6 to turn eye genes on. And then evolutionarily, the eye must have arose in mammals and PAX6 runs it. Um, there was, if you think about evolutionarily, if there was a common ancestor between, um, between cephalopods, between uh, octopus and mammals, that organism did not have an eye. So that was a, a two uh, additional makings of eyes. Both of those pattern eyes by using PAX6. Uh, it's kind of a conundrum that why, if you independently involve very drastically different eyes, why'd you use the same gene and why is that same gene still capable of making the other type of eye? Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. Um, so we studied lots of gene expression, relatedness of organisms, how does that play out in terms of how they develop and what genes they use to develop. And there's also interesting cell biology that goes on in, um, in developmental studies too. So here is a developing limb. Uh, this is a developing uh, Actually, I don't know what this organism is. It, yeah, I'm not sure. But in any case, this is the limb to begin with, and see all this tissue in between the digits? Um, as this grows, so the, so the digit cells are dividing more, they're differentiating, they're patterning, they're organizing themselves together, but there's still tissue in between there. And at, 
At a certain point in the process, those cells are triggered to undergo apoptosis. So they actually die off. And then when they die off, you get these unique, distinct appendages, right? If, you, if there's something wrong with that apoptosis signaling pathway, then you get organisms that, that's, that uh, have unique digits, but then still have that same tissue in there. Uh, this is a really um, obvious example because it's an adult phenotype, but apoptosis is going on in an embryo all the time, and certain cells have like reached their level of usefulness, and then they just die off. And so there's really programmed pathways of how um, cells continue to remain and be functional or you know, die off in order to make sure that the embryo develops properly. So genes, animals, cells, we talk about it all in development. So. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.